Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on the show, we have Robin Foy. Robin and his wife, Sandra, have investigated psychic phenomena for over 40 years. He was a core member of the Skull Experiment Spirit Team in the UK in the 90s, which was a five-year investigation into life after death. The events that occurred during the Skull Experiment were astonishing. Over 1,000 hours of recordings were made. They experienced spirit voices, spirit materializations, apports, which are objects appearing out of thin air. They even had video evidence and photographic evidence, including images appearing on sealed rolls of film without being shot by a camera. Now, I have in my hand right now Robin's book, Witnessing the Impossible, which I have to tell you, the pictures are incredible, and it's filled with information. And I feel this is a must-read for anybody that's interested in physical phenomena and the afterlife. Robin and the Skull Group were also featured in a film called Afterlife Investigations. Now, you can learn more about the Skull Experiment at skullexperiment.com. Robin also has set up a great website for people interested in pursuing physical mediumship, which you can visit at physicalmediumshipforyou.ning.com. It's the number four and the letter U, and then N is in Nancy. physicalmediumshipforyou.ning.com. So, Robin Foy, a warm welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Uh-huh. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome very much. And you're coming to us today from Spain, correct? Yep, sunny Spain. Very hot out here at the moment. Oh, how long have you been in Spain? 11 years now. How nice. How nice. Very well, good. Well, you know, sort of, it's a nice place to retire to. Yeah. yeah, I've never been to Spain. Portugal, close, but not Spain. So, uh-huh. Robin, can you take us back in the beginning uh, before you got involved in the world of the afterlife and to maybe, you know, how you were living and what got you interested in even experimenting with, with afterlife research? Well, I've always had an interest in uh, in ghost stories from being a small child. And my parents indulged me a whole lot at birthdays, Christmas, etc., um, by buying me books on it. I still have some of the original books. Um, but it always fascinated me. And we always used to have... Um, uh, a, a sort of family uh, joke about various properties probably being haunted. Um, but that it, it was something there that was sort of just inherent in me, I think, interested in the subject. Um, but uh, it, it was some years before I really got involved in any way, shape or form. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I, I went through uh, a, a career, firstly, as a, a pilot in the Royal Air Force. Uh, and then uh, in, in into uh, paper manufacturing. At least I was on the selling side of uh, a paper mill, um, selling paper, and went to a, a few different mills whilst I was working. Um, eventually, ending up working for, for mills in Finland. Um, but uh, to get it, you know, to sort of uh, talk about how I really got into this. Eventually, um, I was beginning to think that I needed to do something in life that might help other people. Mm -hmm. And there was a a, a definite moment um, when I was walking a dog uh, fairly late at night, uh, and uh, I just put out the thought um, to nobody in particular that I would like to do something um, to help other people. Uh, And uh, from that moment on, everything seemed to change. And within about a week or a couple of weeks, there was an advert appeared in a local paper asking for people who were interested in psychic research to get in touch um, with the guy that had written the advert. Well, it was an advert that um, was anonymous. There was no name or anything on there, Um, but who wrote into a box number. And this chap sort of came back and and said, yes, you know, we'd like you to come for an interview. Didn't really know what it was about. It it was just psychic research, basically. And then when I turned up in this, uh, uh, this guy's house, he was an American, actually, called Elmer Brown. Uh, and he'd been running uh, physical circles for a number of years. 
he was also a very good friend of a chap called Leslie Flint, who's an extremely famous or was an extremely famous uh, medium in the UK, yes. uh, physical medium, who got independent voice. That is to say, he had voices in the room where we were all sitting that we could converse with um, that were spirit voices. Uh, and you could hear Leslie talking at the same time as the voices were talking. Incredible. Uh, so, I mean, that was quite an experience. But when I went along for the interviews at his place, um, we sort of talked about what he was doing and physical mediumship. And he gave me a pretty good idea as to what it was all about. And I was very interested. But there were about 12 people went along for interviews here. Uh, and uh, not all of them were sort of admitted in, into the thing. But he did say to us before we left, um, would you like to see the room that, um, uh, that you know, we're going to use for it? And we all said yes, of course. So in a sort of crocodile, we all walked up the stairs. Well, this house that he was living in um, was a good distance from the, uh, from the road. Um, you know, and, and uh, it didn't have uh, a house within easy reach either side of it. And there were fields at the back. But as this sort of crocodile with me and it walked up the stairs, uh, everybody there heard the sound of a baby crying. Uh, now, you know, this was a little bit unusual, a little bit unsettling at the time. Sure. Uh, we happened to mention it to, uh, to the chap, you know, that I'd heard this. And he simply said, oh, well, maybe it's spirit telling you something, you know, giving you a message. And didn't really think anything more about it. Um, when I got home within a week um, of going to this place for an interview, um, there was a, a phone call because my then wife and I had applied to adopt. And uh, we suddenly got a phone call saying, uh, we've got a baby for you. Come and collect. Mm. And so that was my message from spirit. And I was sort of hooked after that. So I, I got into this first um, circle. Uh, and we started to get some some very interesting stuff happening. Um, for instance, I mean, it was a bare room um, with just sort of chairs around the walls, uh, and there was a record player there. Uh, and uh, the the uh, circle leader, Elmer Brown, sort of changed the records. It was held in the dark, but the the, um, the chairs were so close to the wall behind uh, that nobody could have got behind them in any way, shape, or form. Um, but I think the very first time I went there, I was prodded in the back by solid spirit fingers. Uh, and that really sort of started me off. Sure. Wow. So, you know, I, I went on from there. And this chap, as I say, knew Leslie Flint very well. Um, so I had the opportunity within a few months of going with his group to meet Leslie Flint uh, and sit with him. And we had about 15 spirit communicators came and talked with us. Uh, and that was it. I was absolutely hooked 100 percent. And from that moment onwards, you know, I didn't want to know about anything other than um, physical mediumship and its phenomena. Wow. I, I, absolutely nothing about um, mental mediumship, nothing mm -hmm. at all. Um, but one of the, the sitters in that first group was a, a, a mental medium who, who uh, served churches. Uh, and she actually clued me in a little bit about it. But I, I, we, I started off on the physical side and I've done that ever since. Oh, sure. And I'm excited to find out more about the physical side. Can we just back up a little bit to Leslie Flint? I'm just trying to paint a picture. You were sitting in a group uh, and um, Leslie was there and isn't it that like an independent voice box would materialize and people would speak through that to the audience? Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's that's absolutely true. Leslie's mediumship, as it, as are the mediumships and most of the physical mediums that you've known or heard of uh, in the past, are what's known as ectoplasm-based um, because the spirit world used this substance, ectoplasm, um, to produce the results. Um, what we did at Skoll was totally different um, because we were pioneering with our spirit team a brand new way of working uh, that wasn't ectoplasm based, but that was energy based. And all the phenomena that took place at Skoll and the various places in the world where we did demonstrations um, was done by energy. Uh, and th this, th our spirit team at Skoll explained to us that there were three energies involved in this. Uh, first and foremost uh, was the energy, the spirit energy that was brought by the spirit team themselves at our sittings from the spirit world. Uh, and the second one um, was the spiritual energy of the sitters, which, of course, they only borrowed. They didn't take and, and not give us back. Mm -hmm. And the third one um, was 
columns of natural earth energy, uh, which is found in, in spirals in certain geographical locations in the world. Add those three together and you get what our spirit team termed um, creative energy. Uh, and this was stored in a glass dome in the room. Uh, and when a spirit person, for instance, um, was teleported because um, they didn't materialize in our, our session, they were teleported quite whole into the room. And you had a whole spirit person who was initially invisible to us, um, but who was able uh, through uh, the mind um, to mentally increase or decrease the density of their spirit body till it became partially or totally solid. So that we then had spirit people with totally solid spirit bodies uh, walking amongst us. Uh, and on occasions, we had up to eight spirit people in our room at the same time. So it was dark when you conducted these, correct? It, it was indeed, but um, our spirit team were working um, all the time on producing spirit lights um, so that we could, um, with the aid of these spirit lights, see what was happening from time to time when necessary. But you could also feel them, if you had mentioned... Oh, having... you, could, you could most certainly feel them. I mean, they were quite 100% solid. Oh. Um, but there were occasions when um, the solidity was only partial. Um, for instance, we did a whole load of demonstrations uh, in Los Angeles, in, in California, uh, and San Francisco. Uh, and during those demonstrations, there was one lady um, who, with her husband, also actually had a... Uh, a circle to um, uh, develop physical phenomena um, who came along and who um, on, on the occasion because our spirit team said to uh, several of the sitters um, you know you, you're allowed to touch back if a spirit person touches you and she uh, <laughs> she talked about feeling a spirit hand touching her uh, and she then sort of felt the spirit hand um, felt the sleeve above it um, that the person, I mean, this, was, this was totally animated, obviously, um, it was exactly the same as any live person. Uh, and she felt up the arm, um, higher up the arm, as far as the elbow, uh, and the, the arm stopped at the elbow. There was no more beyond that. So wow. they were able to partially materialize or partially um, transform themselves into a solid spirit. That's absolutely incredible. And were the people that coming through, the spirit people, were any of them relatives? It, it, was it people could recognize? Um, you know, was it? Oh, very much so. Okay. When when we actually um, gave um, demonstrations, we had seminars sometimes in the UK um, where maybe up to, to ten or twelve people would join us. Uh, and uh, the same when we were demonstrating abroad, of course, uh, and. Uh, during many of those, um, people would have a relative come along uh, and uh, be, be able to sort of converse with us in, in different ways. There were actually five different ways in which we were, we were able to um, uh, speak to spirit um, independently. Uh, and uh, these five ways, um, first, first and foremost, was deep trance because our, our two mediums in the group were in deep trance throughout, so they were not, not able to really see and hear what was going on. Um, but my wife and I saw everything, the whole thousand hours that um, Skoll happened. Uh, and so, you know, we're very, very lucky, and I suppose we're probably the only two people in the world yes. that saw absolutely everything that was going on. Um, but the first uh, method of conversing with spirit... Um, direct communication through deep trance because of the, the trance state they were in and spirit people would speak to them. Now, that wasn't independent at that stage, but we were able to get instructions from our spirit team, members of the spirit team, um, through the trance. And then secondly, um, spirit developed what they called extended voice so that in fact they, they um, um, uh, well, they, they doubled the sort of... Um, the length of, of um, uh, vocal cords inside the the, the, uh, the medium, uh, and, and then extended that voice um, to various parts of the room. So it sounded as though the voice was coming from various parts of the room, even including inside the walls. Wow. Uh, and uh, that was quite amazing to hear that. And then, of course, we've got 
exactly the same as the independent voice that Leslie Flint had, except that it was done in a different way. Uh, and so we, we always called ours energy voices because the spirit team um, tried to get us to sort of change the, the terminology that was used by physical mediums who, who were working with ectoplasm. So we, we needed to try and get people realizing that it could be done in different ways. Uh, and in fact, um, working with ectoplasm for the medium is quite dangerous. Um, but working with the energy as we were, um, there's absolutely no danger to mediums or sitters um, through the, the phenomenon that was going on. And if somebody did something stupid, such as switching on a, an electric light in the middle of it all, all that would happen was that the phenomena would stop. Nobody harmed at all, which obviously is very much an advantage. Yeah. Um, but the, the, um, uh, we then had um, direct voice, but which was coming through uh, a small, um, cheap tape recorder uh, that we used to play the music in our session. Uh, and it was coming through the amplifiers of, of that tape recorder. Uh, and the spirit team told us that they were actually using the silicon chip um, to enter into the, that was the, their portal, to get into the um, um, cassette tape recorder um, to speak to us. Uh, and we had, through, through that method, we had so many people that were able to speak directly um, to relatives and loved ones that they'd lost, um, speaking through the amplifier of a tape recorder. And then finally... Um, Spirit wanted us to produce a little um, piece of um, uh, machinery um, that would, a would actually allow us to speak not just um, to the spirit world directly, but also to um, uh, dimensions beyond the spirit world, in other words, um, ETs. Uh, and uh, it was only a very small little bit of equipment, probably no more uh, or no larger than the size of a, a large box of matches. Uh, and uh, through this, eventually, it took some months until it really started to work properly. But we were able to, uh, to speak um, to various people uh, directly through this. Uh, it was plugged into an amplifier. Uh, and the very first person that gave us a blueprint for this um, was um, um, Thomas Edison himself. Uh, and he produced the blueprint on an unopened film, uh, which he signed with initials um, um, TDC. Uh, sorry, no, he, he um, TAE rather, his initials. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when the um, uh, the scientists that sat with us on regular uh, occasions um, compared this this um, initial signature with one they got from the Edison Institute in America, uh, the, the initials when they, that were on the film, when compared with his initials in life, that, where he'd signed a memo in 1926, they were virtually identical. Uh, and, and actually, when we finally got this little bit of uh, machinery working, um, the very first person to talk to us was Thomas Edison himself. He spoke to us for over 15 minutes. That's incredible. I, need, I just want to ask a um, couple things. One, you were highly tested by people, very oh, documented. I, Could you just explain a little bit about that? Because I think to to a skeptical mind, you know, it's like, well, what's proving this guy is telling the truth? And I know that you were tested by so many different researchers. Well, we, we, we were, because our, our own spirit team were quite happy um, to allow um, three selected um SBR members who, who were scientists to come and sit with us on a regular basis. Uh, and they, um, uh, they, they were um, um, Arthur Ellison, who was a professor himself. Um, there was David Fontana uh, and there was Monty Keane. Uh, and they, uh, they were okayed by spirit to come along. Well, normally speaking, um, very, very few physical mediums uh, want uh, anybody from the SPR, the Society for Psychical Research in London, and there's a, a, a branch of this in uh, in America, um, to come and sit with them because they're so sceptical um, that uh, members are so sceptical um, that generally speaking they don't really get to see everything. 
um, because they can be too um, too sceptical and actually put everybody off. Mm -hmm. But in this fact, these these three gentlemen came on a regular basis for over two years and actually wrote a report between them called the Skull Report, which is still available. Uh, and it, it's written in a more scientific way uh, from what they were able to personally observe. Uh, and out of everything they observed, uh, it was quite amazing because uh, they came to the conclusion that it was 100% genuine. Uh, and uh, consequently, uh, that was the first time for many, many years that members of the SPR had produced a book um, to back up what they believed was uh, was a very true method of communication. Hmm. Oh, and about the uh, photography, that's one of the first things that I had found out. Um, could you explain a little bit about the unopened rolls of film and how that happened? Well, we we started uh, we started working um, with ordinary uh, thirty five millimeter film in a camera. We brought this into the seance room um, in, in two cameras to begin with. Um, they were brand new films that had just been put in there. Uh, and uh, my wife, Sandra, was asked by the spirit team um, when, as, as, as one of the certain spirit people said now, to pick up the camera and take a picture, even though it was in full darkness. Uh, and uh, so she did this uh, until the film was actually finished. Uh, it was a 35, um, or sorry, 36 um, film, and uh, uh, she um, did that. But whilst she was doing that, one of the other cameras levitated by itself, moved around the room, and started to take pictures on its own. Um, when these films came back, although they'd been taken in total darkness, um, we couldn't believe they were they were our films but to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, because there are all sorts of different pictures, scenes from different parts of the world, um, diff uh, all sorts of, of different things. Uh, and uh, we didn't recognize any of them and certainly hadn't taken any of these pictures. Um, but Spirit were able to do that. And then that developed um, because we started to work <coughs> with uh, uh, films that were not in the camera at all, um, but were po Polaroid films so that we were able to um, um, sort them out after the picture and develop them. Sorry, after the sitting and develop them. Uh, and uh, these happened purely and simply because we approached Polaroid uh, and asked them what they thought about the other films we'd, uh, uh, we'd produced. Uh, and they, they decided that they would back us and they gave us a whole load of very, very expensive films uh, and a little um, thing that we could use to develop them. Uh, and that worked extremely well. And uh, we, were, we were developing these wonderful films, which had never been out of uh, shop wrapping. Uh, and uh, we, we got uh, films on there, again, all sorts of different things, um, some of which were areas uh, areas in the spirit world themselves so it was uh, it was quite an amazing thing and sometimes uh, there would be images on those films that were four feet long the length of the whole film uh, and uh, you know it was quite amazing that some of the best evidence we got there was with these three scientists from the SPR who sat with us. Uh, I remember I watched not too long ago the film Afterlife Investigations, which is yeah. you can see on YouTube or anyone who's listening right now, if you just scroll beneath this episode, I have a link to the film. But it's amazing because I don't know if it was someone from the film uh, company itself, but you know, he was explaining that no one has, t these are brand new rolls of film, no one has touched them. And then it went into a small wooden box, I believe, right? And then, it, did, it did indeed, yeah. They, they were locked in there and the scientists would actually hold the box so that they knew nobody could possibly have touched it. Yes, and then uh, when it was complete, there were things on the images on the film. That's right, yes, yeah. Yeah, and I, 
I th- I'm thankful to you for your book, Witnessing the Impossible, that you actually put pictures in there because it's one thing for us to talk about it, but it's a whole nother thing to see that and to see the initials of Thomas Edison. And, oh, it's, it's great. I wanted to ask yeah. you too, how, what was the main form of communication between the spirit world and your team besides Edison doing the drawing on the film of a s- small match book size, uh, matchbox size Device. Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 that, that was one of the experiments, but the mm-hmm. main form of communication um, was actually through deep trance, uh, through the two mediums who were both in deep trance throughout, uh, and spirit people spoke through both of them. That's great. Now, now, when you first formed the circle, was it just the four of you? No, um, we started off with seven. Seven, okay. Um, there was a, one lady who, from a, a, a local town um, who, who owned a marine engineering business uh, and a couple that came from Stansted where the um, um, the spiritualist college is uh, and uh, the rest were, were two the two mediums and my wife and myself. And did you have any instructions like how did you know to sit in the dark and what is the purpose of sitting in the dark? Well because by that time we'd, all, we'd already been involved in this for okay. 30 years plus. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know it was after that. Oh, long yeah, yes. you uh, uh, yeah. I mean, we'd, we'd both been involved um, in total now for um, about 44 years. Uh, and at that time, um, we were nearing 30 years. But I'd been involved in other organizations uh, where I'd been able to learn and teach about physical mediumship and its phenomena. And I personally started an organization in 1990 called the Noah's Ark Society. Um, because at a particular um, seance that I've been to, um, somebody came through from the spirit world and asked us to start a society um, to rescue physical mediumship uh, and its phenomena. And that's exactly what we did, because in 1990, um, physical mediumship looked as though it was going to disappear altogether. Most of the people involved, the old mediums, were sort of dying off, as it were, uh, and not many people were sort of developing it along the line. So we were we were charged by spirit, really, to bring it back into the public domain and get people interested, which we did. And uh, we were able to sort of, because I'd been involved in, in, in um, physical mediumship for many years, uh, Sandra and I had, had run many, many home circles of our own and achieved some very good results um, during those. Plus, of course, we'd gone to other people's circles where, they had um, um, phenomena, uh, and we were able to help and advise, and that's something that we still do uh, when people ask us about how they can do it. Does the spirit world, I mean, uh, uh, most is taking place in the dark. Is there a reason, they say, for darkness? Yeah, absolutely. Um, basically, um, what they say is, is, is that they are um, speeding up the process um, of bringing uh, bringing out human life in a way. So if you think about it, um, we in our, our uh, own lives are sort of conceived in the dark. We grow in the dark. Um, w- eventually, we're born out into the light. And that's exactly what spirit intend to do. Um, it's easier for them to achieve these things in the dark. Um, but we were working with them so that they could actually um, develop um, a, a new form of mediumship using energy um, where they could use the spirit lighting to show absolutely everything that, that was happening. Would you talk a little bit about the spirit lighting? Because I know that it was mentioned in the, the Afterlife yeah, Investigations film. Yeah, one of the film, very but... first things that we got, spirit lighting. Uh, and uh, I think one of the very first occasions that we actually came across spirit lights was that we had up to 30 spirit lights um, shot into our central table um, from the air um, and disappeared through the central table, came out from the bottom, and then um, 30 would sort of shoot out again. So this this was one of the first things we heard. Sometimes it could be done. They'd go into the table with a ping. Sometimes they'd do it totally silently. Uh, but it started from there, and then as time went on, uh, they, were ama- they were quite uh, amazing aerobatics that they were able to do with these lights uh, and uh, they started experimenting with different colors of lights as well um, 
eventually sort of putting them into the dome which uh, sat in our central table uh, and uh, they worked it so that eventually this dome would light up with a spirit light for anything up to two hours or more. Oh, it's incredible. How did you feel? I can't even imagine when you first started witnessing some of this new phenomena sitting there. Well, it, it was quite amazing. I mean, really, wow. you almost had to pinch yourself that you were seeing it. Um, but it was quite 100% genuine. There's no doubt about it whatsoever. And, of course, I've got to the point now where I've been in this for over 40 years where people say to me, well, you know, you've been involved in this 40 years plus. You must believe in life after death now. And I always say to them, no, I don't. And they look at me a bit askance. And I say, well, I know that it goes on. I know that it's genuine. Uh, and there's an awful difference between knowledge and belief. Oh, that's a good distinction to know. Yes, there certainly is. Yeah, there's faith, there's belief, and then there's knowing. Well, that's right. I mean, we, we worked um, with, with the spirit team, helping them with their development. Uh, and we used to eventually sort of get sheets of light which would illuminate spirit figures um, who had been teleported into the room. Uh, not only that, but the, the, the spirit team developed the spirit lights so that they could heal people. Uh, and uh, we saw that the spirit lights were actually going into the body of people. Are you still there? OK. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, I'm yes, excited. Well, I'm healing. Uh, I, I didn't know uh, about the yeah. healing. And uh, we, used, we used to get these little spirit lights would actually, I mean, they, they were uh, visible to absolutely everybody, but they would shoot into your body. And I was used as a bit of a guinea pig um, so that in the early days, um, one of these spirit lights would shoot into my chest uh, and I could feel it actually fluttering around all around my body inside like a little butterfly or something. Uh, and then after five minutes or so, uh, it would shoot out of my arm or something similar to that. And we had a lot of people that had some wonderful healing through that. Again, when we were demonstrating out in, in, in um, California, there was one lady out there uh, who'd sort of been arthritic for many, many years and could hardly walk. And her knees were really clammed up and she couldn't do anything with them. Uh, and she came and sat with us um, out there on one occasion. And one of these little spirit lights went into one of her knees uh, and uh, came out again about five, six minutes later. And then after that, when she got home, she realized she hadn't got any pain whatsoever left in that, uh, that knee. And she'd had it for years. So her, um, her answer to that was she came back again in another week and sat with us again. And little spirit light went into her other knee. Uh, and uh, we were all seeing this as it happened. Uh, and uh, then it did exactly the same. And she, she lost all the pain from that other knee. And, you know, now, I mean, this, this was going back to about 1996. Uh, and uh, over 20 years later now, and she's still not got any pain in her knee. That is miraculous. And it's so powerful. Uh, we, we've, we've spoken to a few um uh, trance healers on this show and yes. to just know the power of the spirit can be that really powerful absolutely yes wow robin when you first sat in in these circles uh, even the skull experiment um, does it take time before the phenomena starts happening yes it does I, and i have to be honest about it i mean if you're if you're working with ectoplasm and several of the mediums today are still developing using ectoplasm, mm -hmm. uh, then it can take anything up to 15, 20 years. You've got to be extremely dedicated, extremely committed, and very passionate uh, to be able to sit there and develop it. But that's an ect the ectoplasmic way of working. Um, if you know, you, you, you're working in a newer way using energy, um, it starts to develop, generally speaking, within months rather than years. That's exciting. And I stumbled. Our, our spirit team actually um, uh, literally dictated for us a basic guide, um, which many, many people have used since then. Uh, and uh, it can still be downloaded um, at a small cost of just 10 euros. Uh, and it really gets anybody that wants to start. It goes through absolutely everything. Uh, and spirit explain it and, and so forth and so on. And so many people that have taken that guide up and downloaded it uh, are doing extremely well with their phenomena now.
Mm -hmm. And I, that was exactly the question I was going to ask you. I'm on your website, skolexperiment.com, and there's a tab that's called The Basic Guide. And that's the one. Yeah. yeah, I downloaded it myself, and I thought, because now th this physical phenomena is fairly new to me within this past year. I had no idea. And some of the pictures that I've seen back from the early 1900s, I mean, a lot, some of that looks fake. And of course, I wasn't there. And who am I to judge one way or the other? But for present day to be able to encourage people and give people the tools to start these circles on their own. Um, and I've spoken to people that are in small circles and things are levitating and, and voices are coming out of a trumpet. And, and uh, even a, a fellow that I just talked to has put out a Facebook question not too long ago and he's already come up with 300 groups that are small and, and practicing and many of them started with your basic guide. Absolutely, yes. Oh, wow, this is exciting things. Um, but it takes people dedicated, right, and meeting at a, on a regular yeah, basis? Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're really going to get into it, you do have to have those three things. Um, you've got to be totally committed, um, you have to be dedicated to it, and you really have to be passionate and believe in what you're doing. Yeah, and then the sky's the limit. And, and it is, we're recording this in 2017, and I know it's a very... Uh, intelligent spirit world and i'm sure there are members on the spirit team in that realm that are interested in more people experimenting and maybe what else is possible besides what's already been done before oh very very much so and i'm sure there are brand new ways of working even now that are, that are happening and when you think about how fast technology has changed uh, and gone forward um over here you know on earth um then you know generally speaking it can be a lot faster in spirit. And I, I think that, you know, Jen, it, it, it's quite possible for absolutely anything to be done. I mean, I, I believe that spirit can do anything they want to do. Wow. And they're looking for us to be their partners on this side, I think. Well, that's, that's right. Yeah, I mean, they, they referred to us as ambassadors for the spirit world, which is probably a good way of looking at it. Uh, yeah, I would say so. Um, could you talk a little bit about the video evidence that you have Captured. Yeah, that's, that's another aspect, of course, uh, is that we started to do video experiments, but sort of working with them. Uh, and uh, uh, they produced some very, very good work, but it took a long time. Um, we started off by, uh, by hiring a video camera and didn't really get very far. And then we had a couple of our spirit team members um, who were um, spirit world scientists uh, who came along and suggested ways that we could set up this using mirrors and using two video cameras uh, and uh, we got some fantastic stuff in the end on video I mean we were actually getting um, animated video pictures of ETs amongst other things and of course we actually had visits um, from ETs who were teleported into the, uh, the group on a few occasions uh, and that in itself was quite fantastic um, but there, there was so much on, on the video camera. I mean, the first video camera we had that we owned was donated by a doctor in, um, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, and uh, eventually we were getting these animated pictures again. It took a good two years, really, to get the, uh, the video work, to get it developed sufficiently well for them to be able to do this. Um, but we really did get some very good stuff there. Just incredible. And now can you speak about app ports? I am totally fascinated that something could come <laughs> out of nowhere. Well, that, again, that was one of the very first things that we got. I mean, the, the, um, uh, there was an app port of, of a coin called a Churchill crown, which had a picture of Winston Churchill on it. Uh, and is, is, is uh, actually, I think they're still around in the UK. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I have to think about it because I work in euros over here now. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, uh, that was the very first thing we got. It was a Churchill crown, and we got it from Spirit. They said, uh, this is to prepare you um, for something quite wonderful. It's only the start of, of the process that is going to be quite amazing. Uh, and from, you know, from, from our point of view, we had something in the region of 150 apports from uh, different times, all sorts of different things very small um, charms for charm bracelets. It was one of a Noah's Ark that was brought for us, I think because I'd started this Noah's Ark society. Um, 
Actually, I do. Uh, there is another book which I think you can get from Amazon. I don't know whether you've had that, um, which, which is called In Pursuit of Physical Mediumship. Yep, sitting That's right next to me. Book. Yep, yeah, got right. it. <laughs> I'm a big fan, Robin. <laughs> That's it. And I, that, that goes into it quite deeply in some of the things that, uh, that we had at the beginning. Uh, but uh, we had um, uh, all sorts of things, you know, some were little bits of jewellery, um, nothing dramatically um, uh, expensive or important. Um, but one of the things we had, for instance, and just to show that they had a sense of humour, um, was that they brought us one of these saucy, sea cards, um, saucy sea, seaside postcards, um, which uh, sort of had a, depicted somebody um, in a seance, and they said a saying, uh, you know, if if you're alive, speak to us. If you're not, then uh, <laughs> then go away. <laughs> but uh, it, in, and uh, not only that, but we had um, uh, some sacred ash was apported on one occasion, uh, and this we thought might be a little bit like the vibhuti that people had talked about. So one of the two us, one of, one or two of us, licked our finger and just uh, put it into the ash and tasted it. Uh, we were quite shocked when we discovered it was actually the uh, the ashes of an Indian holy man. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> but uh, that in itself, and and also we we were watching a program on the television before we went down on one occasion, uh, and this was a wildlife program, and they had monkeys in it. Uh, and when everybody arrived, of course, we turned the television off. Uh, but we went we we went down into the cellar, which is where we held the seances. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, we'd not been there very long and started the, the sitting uh, when there was a big bang on the table that sounded as though a brick had landed on there. Uh, and uh, when the lights went on at the end, this was actually a wooden carving about six inches long uh, of a monkey. Uh, so they were telling us that they'd been watching the television with us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it, that sort of thing, it, it, you know, was, was, was quite normal for for some of the things that came through from there um we had for instance some pristine newspapers uh, that looked as though they'd just come off the press uh, that were from the 1940s wow uh, th- this you know was in the 1990s and it was wartime newsprint mm-hmm. so that um if you if you sort of um, um open them up to the air or or to the sunlight Within a day, they would have gone totally yellow, but they weren't. They, it was in very good condition, this paper. And the three guys who came and sat with us from the SBR um, actually had a very small bit of this one of these newspapers uh, sent off um, to a, an organization uh, that tests um, paper, an uh, organization called Pyra, Print Industry Research Association. Uh, and they were able to come back and verify that this paper uh, of the newspapers was genuine wartime newsprint, um, which was absolutely unbelievable. That um, All that time later, about 50 years after the war, uh, and uh, the, these things were there looking absolutely perfect. And we put them in um, airtight containers afterwards. Mm-hmm. But within a week, even though they were in air, airtight containers, they'd all gone yellow. So it, it just simply... Um, that is spectacular. The, the real stuff. Yeah. It's hard to have a skeptical mind. I mean, not just a skeptical, but you know how some people say it just can't be true. Can't be. Right. And have yeah. those things happen. I yeah, bet no, there's been quite a few lives changed uh, learning about the school experiments and even sitting in with some of your uh, group from time to time. That's, that's right. I mean, it did, it did actually change a few people's lives. Well, when you think of... Uh, the reality of life after death, it gives questions and could give meaning to what is our life for right now. Well, exactly. Yes, yes. Wow. I, mean, you... I, I, I think that the earth basically is a schoolroom. You do. Uh, we, we come to learn. We come to sort of get experiences that we need um, for our onward um, progression. Yeah, I, I would agree. Could you just describe uh, your two books that I have in front of me? Your first is In Pursuit of Physical Mediumship. That, that's right. Now, that, that book basically um, it gives everybody the picture of exactly what happened with me, how I got into it, mm-hmm. uh, my early interests, 
some of the circles that we we'd been involved in, Sandra and I, um, over the years that we'd been married, uh, and uh, the early part of the skull experiment, um, how it came about, who was involved, etc. Uh, and uh, really, it's it's a bit of a sort of psychic uh, autobiography in many ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other book, The Skull Experiment, was written totally differently um, because it's the only book uh, that is completely true uh, and by people that witnessed absolutely everything that was involved in there. This is witnessing... So I wrote that one witnessing, in a, a bit of a diary format Okay, so, um, so that it's, it's, got a, a, it's got a description of every sitting that we had. This is witnessing the impossible you're speaking That's of. Correct, yeah. Okay, okay. I interrupted you there. Sorry about that. Uh, witnessing the impossible. And it's a big book. Uh, but very very heavy <laughs> very heavy and you send that are you are you mailing those from spain is that how that's no they, they're, they're going out from the uk i've got an All agent right. who sends them out for me yeah. yes because i know that it's not uh on amazon it's something that i ordered directly from your website school uh, that's right yes, yes dot com oh i'm very excited i'm really excited about this because it's like what what's possible and and i think like you folks did with the Skull Experiment, doing something more modern, uh, getting involved with physical mediumship. And now, it, 2017, when we're recording this, and what's possible even now. And I think there's so many people that don't even know that any of this happened, don't know of the existence of it, might have heard some stories from the, you know, the early days of physical mediumship. But the fact that if you have a passion for it now, and you're dedicated, and you set the time aside... Who knows what's possible? I mean, Any, anything is possible. That's absolutely true. And I think that perhaps when this um, uh, big movie comes out, sort of um, full screen movie, as we think it might be, um, then it's going to uh, teach an awful lot more to other people about what is possible. Let's talk about the movie. There's a movie being created right now, correct? That's correct. Yes, it is. Yes, yeah. Will you let us know a, a little bit of, about that? I mean, being being written by um, um, by two people who wrote the four, first book about our experiments, um, called the Skull Experiment. Uh, that's Grant and Jane uh, Solomon. Uh, and that book is, is obviously, that's available as well. Um, not from us, but they uh, that can come through uh, Amazon. Uh, and uh, they're also sort of working, um, writing it, along with um, uh, a, a big screen um, producer. So that we, it's, it's not all that far along yet, but the point is that the, the project has started and it looks as though it's going to happen. Oh, that's wonderful. And if anybody wants a little taste of seeing something on video, again, just scroll down to the bottom of this episode and I've got a link to Afterlife Investigations, a film uh, on YouTube. But I'm, I'm excited about this. Now, let's talk about your website, Physical Mediumship for You. What is yeah. that about? Well... Basically, um, it, it's purely and simply um, trying to bring people together. I mean, there's now more than 3,100 members on there. I've run it since uh, I think I started in 2009. Great. Uh, and uh, it, it's really trying to bring people together that are interested. Several of the members on there already run circles, um, and several of the people on there are, are really quite interested in it. So we're trying to sort of bring a lot of information and education to people through that. It's a free site. Uh, it doesn't cost anything to join. Yeah. And people, uh, and, people post you know, we, pictures. We, there are an awful lot of pictures on there. Many of those are posted by members mm-hmm. uh, to do with all aspects of, of um, physical mediumship and the phenomena that comes from that. Yeah, it's nice to have a home to be able to see what other people are doing, share your experiences. Me, myself, being new, even knowing about physical mediumship, I had some questions. Well, how do you start a circle? And then all of a sudden, how did <laughs> I was led to your website by whatever invisible force, and I downloaded well, go, a yeah. basic guide. And then next thing I know, I found myself on physical mediumship for you. And I, I joined that site, not that I've done any experimentation or anything, but just to see that there is a community of people. And so anyone very much so. could get I mean, involved. Some of the members on there are themselves very good physical mediums. Um, I've got an extremely good friend, Kai Muger in Germany, mm-hmm. uh, who is a superb physical medium. He works um, basically with uh, ectoplasm, 
Um, but I've got a feeling that it's probably at his medium ship probably a mixture now of ectoplasm and energy. Uh, and I don't think it's quite as dangerous as it used to be in the old days. Um, but he is getting, uh, at the moment, full form materialization um, in the light. Uh, so, you know, that, that's able to be seen uh, at any sittings that he gives. That's so he is deal. working now with some scientists in Switzerland. Um, to try and help them with their investigations. That's great. That's a big deal to have things starting to happen in the light because I think more and more, the more technology progresses, it's and people's minds even, you know, with the skepticism and things, uh, dark, understand, but can things be done in the light? So why not? You know, try. And that's, well, that's there's exciting. absolutely no reason why not. And I think that uh, Spirit are working more and more um, to bring the spirit lighting and develop the spirit lighting that will allow people to witness these things. Mm. I was just at the Arthur Finlay College a few weeks ago, and the tutor that I had for the course was talking about going to uh, just a small seance, and it was done in light, but it was just turning dark. So it was just a little bit of light in the room, and there were some um, little ping pong balls that not only levitated, but they floated around the air and like almost dancing along with the music. And yeah, came absolutely. back down, and she says it's just phenomenal to see something with, with your eyes. I mean, just phenomenal. It is indeed. Yeah. Oh wow! Uh, is there anything I should have asked you that I have not, or anything else you want to share, Robin? Um, I don't think there's anything at all much there. I mean, we had levitation, um, sort of as, as well. I mean, there were just so many different things that um, uh, that could be uh, uh, could be added to to the stuff that we did. Uh, one of the things that you might find exciting um, uh, for your listeners uh, are the um, percussion phenomena and the musical phenomena that um, uh, that we got. Now, this this guy, uh, our friend Dr. Hans Scher in Switzerland, has a, a, a finger out on the island of Ibiza, uh, and we went there to demonstrate the skull experiment in the very early days. Um, that was our first overseas trip with it. Uh, and uh, he was very much a, a musician. Um, he had um, uh, a trumpet with him. He always does. Not not, not the seance trumpet. Uh, that's the musical trumpet. Uh, when he goes out to stay in his finca or, or his villa out in uh, Ibiza. Uh, and uh, he asked us when we had a session there, um, could he put a trumpet on the table in front of him? Uh, and uh, the spirit team said, yes, no problem. Um, couldn't guarantee that anything would happen, um, but he did that, and in fact took off the um, the mouthpiece, so nobody could actually uh, make, nobody could stand there and, and make that noise through mm -hmm. it. Um, but uh, spirit did actually achieve what he was hoping for, uh, and made some really loud blasts on the trumpet, uh, and that was the first time that that had sort of happened. Uh, and then this chap himself, Hans Share. And we went to stay in his Swiss home on one occasion, did some demonstrations for the Swiss people. Uh, and uh, he had what was known as a music cellar, or he called a music cellar, where he had about 40 different instruments, uh, including uh, two full drum sets. Uh, and uh, um, when we had those sittings there, on two occasions, um, the spirit team were able to play virtually every instrument instrument in the room uh at, and several of them at the same time including the two drum sets that were both being played by spirit drummers wow. at the same time that was absolutely amazing i can't even imagine the look on your face <laughs> to experience <laughs> all that happening at once well we we wow. were just quite amazed because a few people that he'd invited to his sittings um, were totally new to it. And to see their faces at the end and see what they'd made of it was quite amazing. Oh, wow. That's great. Oh, I did have a question. Um, you, yeah. when in a basic guide, you talk about the, uh, the dome. Is that what it's called? The glass yes. dome? Yeah. That is important to have at your, when starting this to, um, capture energy. Is that correct? If you're working with energy, yes, that would that's a okay. very good thing to have, yes. Okay, I'm just thinking of, because uh, I read that and I thought, hmm, uh, but it makes sense. It's not, it's not always vital. 
Okay. Um, it can be done. It, it can be done without, but generally speaking, spirit would use that dome. Um, to store the creative energy. Okay. Well, I, I really appreciate the knowledge in a basic guide because it really was my question. This is all well and good, but how would one get started? And lo and behold, I found it <laughs> in your <laughs> basic guide. I thought, oh, somebody's listening to my questions. <laughs> they certainly are. Well, Robin, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being our guest today. You're very welcome. Oh, this is so exciting for me. It really is. I mean, mental mediumship is great. Don't get me wrong. People can come through a medium and and things, but there's to me there's nothing like being a part of things happening, whether it's levitations or seeing things fly around the room or having a voice coming out of nowhere that's a voice of a loved one. And if we can encourage and and train people, passionate people to do this. And you start witnessing these things yourself. I mean, you go from that believing to knowing that the that's afterlife exa- is real. That's exactly it. And uh, as I said earlier, you know, sort of 44 years uh, has changed belief to knowledge for me. Wow. So you have a good life is what you're saying there in Spain. That's right. Yeah. Oh, Robin, I thank you. Really great. And for our listener, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. Just a reminder, if you go to YouTube, type in Afterlife Investigations. There's a movie that features the Skoll Experiment. I also really encourage you to visit Robin's website, SkollExperiment.com. And not, I mean, you can get the, a basic guide, which is great for how to get started in your own circle, but also, uh, purchase a copy of his book, Witnessing the Impossible. It's the only place I can find to buy this book. And I love it, especially for the pictures. To see what it is that we're talking about is incredible, just incredible. And join physicalmediumshipforyou.ning.com and be part of this community if this is something you're interested in and want to find out more. And as always, you can go to wedontdieradio.com and Check out any one of the past 170 episodes, however many we have, 160, 170. Uh, Also, you can join the Insiders Club and get a free copy of my book, We Don't Die, as well as a healing audio called How to Survive Grief. So lastly, I will be speaking in September in Scottsdale, Arizona at the Afterlife Research and Education Symposium. And there will be some speakers there also talking about physical mediumship. So you might hear from a different person, different angle of this, and be inspired about what's happening. Go to afterlifestudies.org to register or even just find out about that symposium. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. And I, too, believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on Earth is important. So I really want to thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. Mm